gotta make him stop that. You gotta try to get between them and get him out of the picture. You're still stuck on disagreeing. I, I know, I know, this is uncomfortable. You think that is your ministry. Jesus prayed this prayer to his saints, to his ministers. He was trying to tell them not to do what we do. They came back doing something they felt the Spirit of the Spirit, capital T, capital S, led them to do while they were at the altar. And you're thinking, oh my God, get rid of that. I got to stop it. You're still disagreeing. Are you catching this, anybody? Jesus was saying, if you're as spiritual as you're supposed to be in the position that you're in, if they come back, instead of, oh, I got to get rid of that, I got to get rid of that, somebody, whatever she did, stop doing. Whatever she does, feel led to lay off. Whatever right they, you shouldn't be thinking, disagree, disagree, split, split, you should be stand up and say, praise God, look what sister so-and-so's doing. It's a huge difference between disagreeing continually and agreeing on the Spirit. Yes. Yes. Whatever God's doing in their heart at your altar or at their altar or wherever, it is your job as an adult yes. Christian as a godly minister to agree with yes. the Spirit. Yes. 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 Well, I really want to call on her, but she's still wearing that shirt. If you think God did something, if you know God's moving, if you see a countenance different, if they've laid out any one little thing that you know about, regardless of all the junk you still want, you should be saying, Sister, stand up and testify! Why? Why should I do that? That looks, you know, hypocritical. That's that's compromised. No, it's not. It, it is not compromised to agree with the Spirit. The Spirit did it. She agreed with the Spirit. Now she needs you to agree with her with the Spirit. I said that without spinning or kicking or jumping or running or nothing. Praise God. But sorry, can I say something? Sure. I just listening that that scenario you just played happens here anywhere between three to six times at all times, always. And I still have that struggle, but because it's our inclination to straighten everybody out. Yeah. But here's the thing about it, what I've seen is like I preached last night. I've had to try to overcome the issue of mentality in the sense that I want to try to fix what is spiritual with the fleshly hand. But here's the thing about it. If that couple is going to do right, get right, and be in an atmosphere or come into a convicted uh, understanding of what they're doing, where is that going to happen? Where is that, where is that most prone to happen? In this place, in this atmosphere, surrounded by love and, and mercy and compassion. And when we push people and prod people and poke people and act like they're second grade or less than, yes. they're going to leave and they're never, or they're going to leave here and they're going to go to the Baptist church and then they're going to get married at the Baptist church and they're going to stay at the Baptist church and all the kids are going to go to the uh, Baptist church Sunday school. And I'm, I'm kind of okay with that because I'm glad that they're there and they're going, but I'd much rather them be here. And so I've had to fight the, the tendency when I look at someone that's li living in sin. And I see their hand go up, even five years later, seeing thousands of people on this altar. I still have a tendency to want to go to the pulpit and break out 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 yeah. and work it over, especially the first two or three points, really good. And let them know you can't be saved and do the things right. you're doing. But the right. truth is, most of the time, they already know that there's something wrong. And so what we've learned here, again, I don't, I've not always aged it, but what we've learned here is if they're coming, now I'm not putting them in the Sunday school for the teacher. I'm not going to make them a deacon. I'm, I, you know, no, I'm not. 
In fact, at our church, you have to sign a membership covenant to become an official member. And there are certain elements that you're going to have to agree to to become a member of this church. And one of those is that you've got to be married. But that doesn't mean that I have to treat them like trash and I have to treat them like they're nobody because God is doing something or they wouldn't be in the house that night, all right? And so I've said, okay, if God is doing something and they know my stance and they're coming anyway, that means that they're feeling something and I want that. And brother, it is absolutely beautiful. And I just leaned over to my wife and this is what I wanted to share and I'll sit back down or at least I'll shut up. I said, I said to her, if, if a person is living in sin but they're in this house, this is going to be the most highly probable place for them to find what they need. That's right. And it's not me that they need to find. It's God. Yeah. My job is to create, if somehow or another, and I hope this isn't irreverent, with, with our ensemble, our ensemble, the guys that sing, hopefully if you have any ear at all, you know that they didn't just come in here and sing. They practiced and they've, they've prayed. And the reason being is because I would love them to be so anointed that it creates an atmosphere. I would love to preach under such an unction that it creates an atmosphere that the Spirit of God can do what the Spirit of God does. And so I just wanted to say amen because that that right there has played out over and over and over and over. And I've had to run some people out because they wanted to kill them. But the facts were, if they don't let God do what God does, that was going to work itself out anyway. They just needed some love and some compassion. So I'm just saying, right? amen. And I couldn't wait until you were done to say it. I was dying inside. <laughs> Praise God. I will be done in about three or four minutes. Let me just wrap it up. But you'll need to keep them coming. Keep working with them. Allow them to experience for themselves the unity of the Spirit with us. I know this cuts against the grain of almost everything that screams from within our indoctrinated cells. But spiritually, through the specific teachings of Christ, is more important... <clears throat> We have parameters. We've acknowledged this week that it came from God, but we've tweaked it some. We have to make up our minds as ministries. Because at some point, not always, but sometimes you have to pick one or the other. And are we putting, going to put our emphasis when we have to choose one or the other on parameters or on people? Because most of the time I see a lot of emphasis on parameters to the point that we would rather have our parameters right than have any people. Yes, sir. We just about come to the point where we don't care so much about the people as long as we've got good parameters. Compare that to the ministry of Christ. Ours looks sick. He would pick and eat corn on Sabbath. He would get donkeys out of ditches. <coughs> when he broke the rules, he woman caught in adultery he didn't let her get killed and he wouldn't talk to the woman at the well he was supposed to talk to. Not because he doesn't have parameters, but because his priority is people. I know you thought this was going to be about working with people and winning the loss and growing the church, and it is. Yes, it is. Christ knew that if whoever was already in the church could not get along with each other, then they were not going to get along with more people. I've said this before, and I'll say it again in closing. One of the reasons that God doesn't send any more souls to our churches than He does, even when we ask Him for them, because he doesn't want to send people to places where they'll get hurt. He doesn't trust us. <coughs> how does he know that we would hurt them, Brother Sloggett? Because he sees how we treat each other. This is my challenge to HMA and to our ministers and to our visitors. For the rest of this year and on into 2016, 
If you want to show God how you would treat new people if He would kindly send them, show Him by practicing on the old people. Send us souls. God send us souls. You get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. You pray your hour till 7. And you go to work. God send us souls. And at work you get texts from sister so and so. And she's bothering you. And she's a dummy. And she never listens anyway. And after service you go and you line her out. She gets mad. She goes to the church down the road. You tell your wife, I'm mad. She went to that guy. I don't like him anyway. And then you get up the next morning, God send us souls, God send us souls. Do you not think God's up there in heaven saying, are you kidding me? So you can do what? Ignore their texts. Send them down the road. Talk bad about them behind their back to your spouse. We do this, and then we got the, the gall to get in the pulpit and make statements like, well, the world's just getting so wicked. God's only going to save a few. And the reason the church isn't having revival is because this thing's winding down. It's a cop out. No, it's not having revival because you're still in kingdom. It's a cop out. Do you want to fix it? Do you want to go from 30 to 70 in the next 24 months? God said, yes, if you he think will. you'll treat them right. Yes, he will. And you can show God that you'll treat the new ones right if you start right now by practicing on the old ones. Stand all over the time.